This is my boyfriend, mid-century floor lamp. No one does that. I'm not coming back from Christmas tree springs. I'm going to move here. All right, you sappy, soft-hearted degenerates. Let's talk about romance books. Hi, I'm Madeline or just Maddie, and as I've previously stated on this channel, I'm a cartoony covers romance girl, not a shirtless dude photo cover romance girl. So if you're here for the spice, you will find it somewhat lacking. Sorry. So these books do have a little bit of steamy. I don't know why this is my dance for physical affection. Um, there is a little bit of that, but not nearly what the TikTok girls would find acceptable. You don't have to take your clothes off to be romance. We can, we can be romance in full canvas boiler suits. Let's start our discussion today with the 2022 Mad Reads Choice Award winner for Best Book with a Cartoon Couple on the Cover, Book Lovers by Emily Henry. This book is my lover. As I said in my 2022 recap, also known as the Mad Reads Choice Awards, this is one of my favorite romances that I've read, maybe ever. Our main character is Nora. She is a big city literary agent who just got dumped and she would do absolutely anything for her authors or her younger sister Libby. So when Libby would like a break from her incredibly stressful life as a young mom in New York City, she decides that she wants to go visit the small town that's the like fictionalized setting for this book she really loves and she wants Nora to come with her. Nora's like, yeah, sure, I will go with you to go do that. It's basically like the people who went to Forks, Washington after they read Twilight. And then when they're in North Carolina, in this small town, who does Nora run into but her nemesis from the publishing world in New York City, Charlie. So then what was supposed to be just a trip with Nora and her sister turns into an opportunity for Nora to work through some of the conflict and other stuff between her and her, I don't know, literary rival. And maybe they'll learn something about each other along the way. So that's all going on. And meanwhile, there are suggestions that there's something else going on with Libby. Like there's another reason she wanted to go on this trip. I was dying to know what the deal was. And I had all these theories and I kept going like, it's this, it's gotta be this, got it. And then I was wrong. And I love when that happens. So that was extra fun for me and just really kept up the momentum of the story. Like not that the romance part wasn't great, but that was kind of the underlying like, well, I better keep reading because I really want to figure out what's going on with this. I love this book from the very beginning because you learn really early on that Nora has been dumped by multiple boyfriends after they go to a small town for something related to business and then they fall in love with like the girl who runs the bed and breakfast or the girl who operates the cider press or insert quaint small towny job there and then they're like hey Nora I I'm not coming back from Christmas tree springs. I'm going to move here. And the fact that that's happened to her multiple times where Nora has been the uptight city girlfriend that gets dumped in like the Hallmark movie of life is so great. That is a delicious concept for a book and I was very excited when I read that. But just imagine getting that phone call like, Hey babe, I've been gone a week. I'm, I know I was supposed to acquire this orchard for my big corporate business but actually I met the proprietor's daughter and we fell in love and now I'm gonna stay here forever. And then you're just like okay you were there for a week? Sounds great I guess I'll mail you your clothes. Amazing I love it. I also mentioned this when I was recapping a bit of the book for the Mad Reads Choice Awards but the banter between Charlie and Nora in this book is so good. It's so good, whether they're in person or even via text and email. Who has good banter via text and email in a book? No one, ever. It's always bad. It's always bad. Almost always, I guess. But nothing makes me roll my eyes at a book harder than when people are texting or like emailing and they like trail off. Like the email is like, you're just dot 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 different period send email. No one does that. Oh, or when it's like, I didn't mean to send that text. Yes, you did. Ugh. No one accidentally sends a text where they profess their love to each other. I can suspend my disbelief for romance books sometimes, but not to that degree. Anyway, back to the good stuff. Yes, Nora and Charlie, fantastic banter. If the banter escalates to the point that somebody's Venmoing someone a dollar for Bigfoot erotica, and you have these little like inside jokes and then I get to be part of the inside jokes because I'm reading it, that's quality. That's high quality right there. So we've got a great story. We've got good banter. 
like the characters. Another thing Ms. Emily Henry does well, not idealizing small towns. Thank you. I'm from a very small town. There are things about it that are unique and awesome. I'm not one of those people that's like two middle fingers up to my small hometown. There are things I really do appreciate about it. There are also things about living in and being from a small town that are kind of horrible. It's not all like little retro diners with sassy waitresses and really amazing pie. Sometimes it's rampant boredom induced alcoholism. And sometimes the female foreign exchange student gets to be the homecoming queen because she is the only girl in the senior class. That wasn't at my school, that was one school over, but that is a true story. Small towns can be good settings without being Norman Rockwell paintings, and I think this book shows that pretty well. Same goes for cities though. Cities are exciting and cities have a lot going on and cities have a lot of benefits. We can sing Empire State of Mind all we want, but New York City is stinky and expensive. So a theme that came out of this book for me, hello, this is the introduction to my ninth grade literature essay. <laughs> a theme that I realized in this book was balance. It's okay to love cities. It's okay to love small towns. They both have their pros and cons. It is okay to want to dance in the rain, you free spirit. That's wonderful. It's also okay to not want to ruin a very expensive pair of shoes by getting them wet. And that doesn't make you the villain of the story. As long as you feel fulfilled and you have good relationships with the people around you and you're kind, just be yourself. I've talked a lot about this book and very little about the romantic part of this book, but it is, it is a romance book, I promise, and the romance parts are good. Nora and Charlie very much feel like two people who should be together, like it makes sense. And the conflict is realistic and relatable. It's not just like a miscommunication or whoa. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, but it's also not all drama and heartache. Balance. The theme is balance. Now Streaming is a contemporary romance by Ayla Chandler, and it's about rival video game streamers, which is kind of cool. I picked this one up because I was looking for something sort of light to read, and I'm also trying to read less popular books occasionally, and this one definitely counts. It's not really one of those big ones that everybody's talking about, kind of like Book Lovers is. So in Now Streaming, Minerva, who's also called Min, and her gamer tag, I can't say gamer tag with a straight face, I don't know why, anyway, is Flamethrower. She's a video game streamer whose ex-boyfriend, who's all bitter and an a-hole, leaked nude photos of her that he had taken without her consent. And she's a fairly popular streamer, but despite the fact that she is the victim in this situation where her nudes were leaked, which were taken without her consent, she's a victim, wrong was done to her in this situation, she still loses subscribers and sponsorships after that happens. And it's not a great time for her to lose out on income because her sister was in a car accident and needs some help with medical bills. The book doesn't give us much of a connection to her sister or that accident. It kind of just serves as a selfless reason to be in need of money. So there's a big live gaming tournament that's going to happen at a convention and Min is invited, which yay, she might win some money. But there's kind of an unspoken implication that she's only invited to participate as long as her rival is also going to participate. And his name is Death's Head, also known as Hayden. And people really love like their banter and their back and forth and stuff, but he is very private. He doesn't show his face in his streams, but he is known for his deep voice. So when Min and Hayden accidentally run into each other at the offices of the people who are organizing the tournament and sort of recognize each other, she has to convince him to do the tournament because basically if he doesn't compete, she doesn't get to compete and she needs to to help her sister. So that's kind of the setup for the book at large. More things happen from there, but that gives you the gist. Overall thoughts, this was cute. This was a nice cute book. It was an easy read, it went by quick, it was fun. It was fine. My biggest gripe, because you know I gotta have a gripe, is whether or not that's actually how the world and the internet would react if a somewhat popular streamer was a victim of revenge pics. Like I mentioned, Min loses subs and loses sponsorships and stuff because there are naked pictures of her out in the world now. I would hope the feminists and or the decent human beings would kind of rally to her defense if that actually happened and be there and be supportive and stuff. And also I feel like if anything noteworthy, happens to a streamer that brings more attention to them and as a result more attention to their stream 
And in the case of like revenge pics being out there, some of it would probably be people who want to come and harass her or, you know, be mean. But a lot of them would probably be people who just want to watch her play games and they just hadn't heard of her before, but then they did because they'd heard that this horrible thing happened to her. Is that realistic? Let me know if you think that that's true or if you disagree. I don't know. I don't think that it would be maybe as devastating to subs and sponsors maybe sponsorships more so than subs but like subs wise i don't think that people would be like there are pictures of her out there no thanks although some creeps do get weird when girl streamers that they like have boyfriends they take that really personally Ugh, incels are scary so other than that bit where i'm like is that i don't know there could be different ways that it could go but as far as representing the internet culture at large i thought the author did a really good job the online culture part felt pretty true to life without making it all like memed up or putting in super specific references that would be really outdated and cringeworthy in like a year. So that's tough to do and I was pretty impressed with how it was handled here. It's probably really hard to write about anything internet related because number one, like I kind of mentioned, things get outdated very quickly. And also if you're not fully in that world and you try to just write about it based on research, it's going to be immediately very apparent and really like, ew. But I think that this author is sort of in that world because oh, I have a strong, strong suspicion that Hayden slash Death's Head, that character, is based on the actual video game streamer Corpse Husband. Corpse Husband has a very distinctive deep voice like Hayden does. He does not show his face on his stream or like anywhere like Hayden does. And this one's weird, but Hayden is described as having dark curly hair and Corpse Husband showed the internet a strand of his hair on Twitter. The internet's weird, but it was dark. It was dark and curly. So I don't know. I don't really follow streaming that much like I know of popular streamers and stuff, but I know who Corpse Husband is because this is kind of depressing. At the height of the pandemic, when it was also the height of Among Us popularity, I, while working from home, used to throw on YouTube live streams of people playing Among Us, like groups of friends, so like Jacksepticeye or Valkyrie or whoever, I would put that on in the background while I was working because it was just nice to hear the sounds of people socializing together. So that's kind of a bummer. But yeah, Corpse Husband used to play with them sometimes and like I said, he's got a really distinctive voice, so I just remembered that. But I actually went and checked the reviews for this book, which I don't usually do before I talk about something in a video because I don't want to either consciously or subconsciously let reviews sway my opinions of said book. But I wanted to see if anyone else mentioned Corpse Husband in the reviews and at least two of them did. So I'm not the only person who thinks this. Again, fine book. Not a bad way to pass the time as long as you don't think too much about why Hayden had to be at the convention for the live gaming tournament if he doesn't show his face. Like, couldn't he have just logged on from his house if he wasn't going to be on stage with everybody else? But if you don't think about that, fine, fine, cute book. Our last book to discuss today is Love on the Brain by Allie Hazelwood. For fans of The Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood, I'm guessing you've already read this. Did you like it? Did you think it was good? Good. So our protagonist is B, a neuroscientist who gets her dream gig helping NASA with this contract where they're doing a neuroengineering thing that involves helmets. We will come back to the helmets. The problem is her grad school nemesis Levi is also helping out on the project and when she arrives at NASA all ready to go, she finds that she doesn't have the technology she needs, she's not getting invited to all the right meetings that she's supposed to be in and things are just sort of falling apart and she thinks that it's Levi's fault. Or is it? B is also a big fan of Marie Curie, so she has an anonymous Twitter account that she runs around like being a woman in STEM called What Would Marie Do? So there's sort of a B plot related to that whole thing. Okay, so the NASA project is helmets. We're making helmets that will make the NASA astronauts more cognitively good. They can do better thinking because of these helmets. Or if they're not made correctly, they will have seizures because of these helmets. I don't know that I ever fully understood what the helmets were for. And I kind of wanted to because if we're out here building space-based Cerebro for NASA, 
that's more interesting to me than some other parts of this story were, I think. I thought this book was fine and I think I would be kinder to it if I hadn't already read The Love Hypothesis, but in my opinion it doesn't really expand on The Love Hypothesis. It kind of like tiptoes in its footsteps. Like, let's try some of this again. I haven't read Allie Hazelwood's Steminist novellas, but I've heard some criticism that she does the same story in just several different ways, like that they kind of follow a very similar format. And even just between the two full-size novels, I can see that a little bit. Because in both The Love Hypothesis and Love on the Brain, there is a very large dark-haired man and a sort of quirky girl. They work together doing some sort of science and then she makes him lighten up and then together they fight back against interdepartmental politics and misogyny in STEM and they fall in love and that's all great. But the main thing to remember, if you remember nothing else from that synopsis, is that the male love interest is huge. The size of these lads. They are enormous. Our guy in the love hypothesis was clearly Adam Driver because that book started as Raylo fanfiction. For Love on the Brain, my brain made Levi into Dream from Netflix's Sandman, except for like if Dream got the Captain America injections. I think that fits. So just big dark haired dudes. That's what we need to remember from her work. And despite my brain's beautiful casting of the male love interest, I was a little less invested in the relationship in this book, partially because Levi's vegan. And not that there is anything wrong with being vegan, I just don't think a vegan guy would like me. So I guess that just kind of takes away some of the fantasy for me. And also, weep whoop, I'm gonna talk about names again. Levi is the name of a family member of mine, so I didn't really like that either. But I actually want to apologize. So I have made fun of the weird names that authors give the male love interest in their books before. Like Ryle from Colleen Hoover book. I made fun of Ryle's name. However, I did not have to associate Ryle with anyone in my real life because I don't know anyone named Ryle because that's not a real name. Whereas Levi, I have a family member named Levi. So I feel bad for being so critical of names in romance books because you have to walk the line between making something still a name, but not a name where like everyone has an uncle or a brother or a nephew or a weird gross coworker or like a kid they babysit with that name, you know? So what can you do? I'm sorry. I want to make a prediction about the future. I believe that one day we will be able to tell our Kindles what to make characters names in books. So if we need to swap Levi out for something like Diesel or Flannel, Granite, now I'm just saying things from around the room, Mid-Century Floor Lamp, this is my boyfriend, Mid-Century Floor Lamp. Anyway, I believe that eventually ebooks will allow us to do that or someone will create a workaround. Anyway, what was I talking about? What is this book even called? Love on the Brain. If you're only gonna read one Ali Hazelwood book, I'd probably recommend The Love Hypothesis over Love on the Brain, but it's also not a terrible book. So do whatever you want. Was that at all helpful? So there we have it. My recap of one really, really great romance book and a couple of pretty fine romance books. I have another list of like, three or four that I want to talk about, so let me know if you're into this sort of genre and I will continue to dive on in. Before you go, please hit the subscribe button if you would like to. You can even turn on notifications, which would be wild. I also am always happy to see and hear comments from you. I love replying to comments. If you want to throw a like on the video, if you want to Venmo me a dollar for Bigfoot erotica, that's about all I got. I hope you have a great rest of the day and I hope to see you again soon. Is there a book where people fall in love while wearing hazmat suits the whole time? Some sort of dystopian thing? Write that. You go write that. Stop watching this. Go write that. <laughs>